military murder is an independent project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Marco, and this is a true crime podcast where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. All right, before I begin today, I need to make a correction from last week. Last week, I said one of our executive producers was Tina S. with Stitcher 6 to 6 Embroidery. Tina's company's name is actually Stitch 6 to 6 Embroidery. So I just wanted to correct the name of her company so everyone can go check her out. Stitch 6 to 6 Embroidery. All right. I also want to give thanks to everyone who left a new Apple review last week. Thank you so much. Yes, I read every single review and y'all just melt my heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, thanks to all the new folks who followed me on my personal Instagram page. You all get to see pictures of my new little snuggle bug. She's an absolute doll. For those of you who want to check it out, my handle is Military Margot with a T at the end. And I also have a podcast Instagram page where I'm always posting videos in my stories. So you can follow me there at Military Murder Podcast. All right. Last week, I brought you the story of an active duty airman at Eielson Air Force Base who would moonlight as a serial killer. Well, he was busted in March of 83, and three months later, up in Anchorage, Alaska, police were closing in on another serial killer who had been killing women for over a decade. Join me today as I discuss the Alaska Butcher Baker. Now, let's dig in. My resources for this episode include two Investigation Discovery TV shows, One documentary was titled The Butcher Baker, Mind of a Monster, and the other one was Ice Cold Killers, Season 1, Episode 1. I also used articles by David Lohr, Paul Sutherland, and articles in the New York Times and the Washington Post. And finally, I used a 1978 Alaska Supreme Court opinion to inform a portion of this story. Our story today takes place in Anchorage, Alaska. Anchorage is located in South Central Alaska, and due to its location, it is a pretty big refueling hub for international flights. An interesting fact about Anchorage that I learned is that it lies nine and a half hours by air of nearly 90% of the industrialized world. Yikes! That's pretty remote, huh? Anchorage currently has a population of almost 300,000 people. So while this is big for Alaska standards, It is pretty small when compared to other large U.S. cities. For comparison, Miami's population is about 450,000. San Francisco's population is close to 900,000. And Chicago is close to 3 million. So you get the picture. All right, let me take you back to Anchorage circa June 13th, 1983. A truck driver by the name of Robert Yount was beep bopping along driving his truck on 6th Avenue when a woman jumped into the road flailing her handcuffed arms without any regard if she would get hit by a car, a truck, or anything. The truck driver stopped and rolled down his window, and the young girl told him she needed help. She was trying to get away from a dangerous man. It was evident she was in trouble. She looked like a hot mess. She was handcuffed. And to top it off, she was barefoot. The man said, sure, 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 come on in. Let me help you. And he allowed the girl to get in his truck. And then he continued driving. While in the car and still coming down from her frantic state, the girl began to tell the man what happened. The girl was 17-year-old Cindy Paulson. She was a sex worker and she had voluntarily gone with a John. In exchange for $200, she promised oral sex. But as soon as she got into the man's car and began to perform her end of the bargain, he put handcuffs on the girl and kidnapped her. He then took her to his home in the suburbs took her to his man cave in the basement of his house. Now, this man's man cave was quite the trophy room. He had game heads hanging all over the walls. He had a bear rug on the floor. And while this would look like a game hunter's dream, 
To Cindy Paulson, this was a dungeon. And from the looks of it, she was sure she was going to die right next to the rest of those animal heads. The man tied her to a beam in the ceiling and for hours on end, he brutally raped the young girl. Eventually, he fell asleep on the couch nearby. All the while, Cindy kept thinking, how will I ever get out of this situation? But she was smart. While she probably didn't actually think she was leaving alive, she took mental note of every little thing she saw in the event she survived and reported the man. While the man slept, Cindy took mental snapshots. Then all of a sudden, the man woke up and he looked like he was going somewhere and he was, but he wasn't going alone. He was taking Cindy with him. He told her he wanted to take her to his cabin in the woods. They would need to get on his personal airplane. But he promised her that when they returned from their little trip, he would let her go. My ass, she thought. But there was nothing she could do. So off she went. As they left the house, Cindy continued to take mental pictures of things. The color of the house, the color of the car, the man's face. Snap, snap, snap. The entire time she had her hands cuffed in front of her body. She saw as he drove to Merrill Field, the local airport. Then he began to load the plane while Cindy sat quietly and afraid in the back seat. But she knew if she went anywhere with this guy, she would never return. So while the man was loading, she took the opportunity. She snuck out. And when she saw her chance, she ran like hell. The man ran after her, but Cindy had a head start. And that's when she waved down the passing trucker. Now, I want to stop for one minute. Can you imagine running like hell with your hands handcuffed in front of you and barefoot? Now, that's a hard feat, but Cindy did it. Anyway, the truck driver was sure that the woman would want to go straight to the police station. But nope, not a chance. She wanted to be dropped off at a hotel to meet up with her boyfriend. And the trucker, well, he obliged, but there was no way in hell he wasn't going to be reporting this. Cindy met up with her boyfriend slash pimp at the hotel while simultaneously the trucker called the police. Now, police arrived at the hotel where Cindy was dropped off and they eventually found Cindy barefoot, disheveled and still handcuffed. She agreed to talk to the police and she told them the same story she told the truck driver. Now, her story was terrifying. It, it almost seemed fake. But if her memory served her correctly, they should be able to nail this guy, right? Well, police start by heading to Merrill Field to find this airplane, and Cindy's description is so good that they find the plane, just as Cindy described. It was a blue and white Piper Super Cub, tail number N3089Z. They pull up the plane owner's information, and boom, they have a name, Robert Christian Hansen. Turns out that Robert Hansen was a local business owner. He owned a bakery shop in town and he was well respected. He was married and had two kids. According to reporting by Paul Sutherland, within two hours of interviewing Cindy, police pay this Robert Hansen guy a visit. And as they pull up to the suburbs on Old Harbor Road in Muldoon, they were shocked. It was exactly as Cindy described. They knock on the door and the man answers. His name was Robert Hansen. And boom, police are like, what? OK, this looks just like the man Cindy described. He was a man with a small figure, deep acne scars all over his face, kind of reddish hair, glasses. The police tell the guy what Cindy has claimed. And Robert Hansen was taken aback. He was irate, like, what? I cannot believe this woman is saying these things about me. And according to an article in Murderpedia, Robert Hansen, no kidding, jokingly asked the cop, quote, you can't rape a prostitute, can you? End quote. Well, police asked this man where he had been that night. And he said, well, I was with my two friends. They just happened to be both named John. I'll call them the two Johns. So Robert claimed that Cindy was just trying to extort him for money or something. When asked about his family, Robert said that they were on vacation in Europe. Now, police asked if they could go in his house and take a look around. And the man said, sure, come on in. I have nothing to hide. So they enter and everything looked orderly. They went downstairs to the man cave and it looked just as Cindy described. 
animal trophies everywhere, but it looked nothing like a torture chamber. There were no chains, no ropes, and no indication that Cindy was hanging from a beam. So police leave without making an arrest. And when they look up Robert's record, he ain't no saint. He had a few felonies under his belt at the time. When it comes to vitamins, we all deserve to be a little bit of a skeptic. And if you are, that's a good thing, especially when it comes to vitamins, which is why I choose to take the Ritual Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Ritual created a clinically backed multivitamin for women who are 18 and over. Ritual's multivitamin supports brain health, bone health, blood health, and provides antioxidant support. And above all else, Ritual has traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. I've always, or almost always, been a vitamin consumer, but I never liked the taste, chalky and honestly just nasty. I often wondered what all those ingredients even meant on the label, but I figured, hey, I needed the vitamins, so I just put up with the horrid taste and the ingredients I couldn't even pronounce. But that is now an issue of the past, ever since I found Ritual, because Ritual comes packed with nine key nutrients in two capsules per day. So you can take your vitamins and relax knowing that you are in good hands. Another thing is that Ritual is packaged in a minty capsule that will leave you feeling refreshed. I've been using Ritual Essential for Women for two months now and I couldn't be happier. So listen up, no more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. And right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash military10 to start Ritual or to add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a therapist, someone that you could talk to in a judgment-free zone? Maybe you have thought about it, but you were scared away by the thought of taking the first step, or maybe you thought therapy wasn't affordable. Try Talkspace. By doing virtual therapy, Talkspace has made getting people help easy, accessible, and affordable. Y'all don't know this, but some things in my life recently have really gotten me down. I wasn't quite sure how to get out of the funk. I wasn't sure how to get back up. So I figured I would try therapy because I was sure that it would definitely not make things any worse. And I'm so glad that I tried it. I have found new coping mechanisms to deal with stress and I'm now looking forward to my future. Talkspace makes it easy to find a therapist that you like, and it's so convenient to do everything from the comfort of wherever you are, because life sometimes gets hectic. Sometimes I take my calls in my office, sometimes I take my calls in the car. Life is mobile and therapy should be too. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you, and it's typically done within 48 hours. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationship issues, and much more. And right now, as a listener of this show, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash military murder. To match with a licensed therapist today, visit Talkspace.com slash military murder to get $100 off your first month and to show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com slash military murder. I got my hands on the 1978 Alaska Supreme Court opinion of one of Robert's appeals, and this is what it said about his criminal record. In 1961, while living in Iowa, Robert was convicted of willfully and maliciously setting fire to and burning a car. For this felony, he served a month shy of two years in a reformatory and then did one year on parole. Eleven years later, in 1972, Robert was convicted in Alaska for assault with a dangerous weapon. While the court opinion did not go into details of the assault, reporting by Paul Sutherland indicates that this conviction was actually for kidnapping, rape, and assault with a deadly weapon. What? For this crime, Robert was sentenced to five years and a recommendation was made that he receive psychiatric treatment. Well, he only served six months of his five-year sentence and was transferred to a halfway house and placed on a work release program. After a year on the program, he was placed on parole for an additional three years. Then in 1976, old homeboy Robert 
walked into a department store and stole or attempted to steal a chainsaw. He ended up pleading guilty to theft and was sentenced to a whopping five years in prison. Well, Robert subsequently appealed the five-year sentence, stating that it was excessive. His attorneys argued that five years was far too harsh for, quote, a relatively non-serious property offense when the offender has a solid family, employment, and financial background, end quote. The Alaska Supreme Court heard the case and they agreed. They overturned his sentence, stating that the sentence was in fact too harsh. Justice Connor wrote, quote, Hansen's crime was shoplifting a chainsaw. He could have been charged with a misdemeanor. Hansen's theft involved no physical aggression or threats, nor did it result in any physical injury. The property was restored in full to the owner, end quote. Robert was released for time served, seeing as he had already served a year, but the court did indicate he should remain on probation for the remainder of his sentence. And with that, for all intents and purposes, Robert Hansen was a free man. After Robert's most recent arrest in the 70s, he began therapy with Dr. Robert McManman. Dr. McManman diagnosed Robert as manifesting bipolar affective disorder, which is a variant of a manic depression disorder. It was described that Robert's impulses were poorly controlled during the mood and energy upswings of this disorder. It was noted that once Robert was placed on a lithium treatment, his manic behavior improved. But of course, that was always dependent on the person continuing their treatment course. And listen, even with knowing that Robert had three felony convictions, we all know you can't just go off of that. So police needed to follow up on his alleged alibi witnesses who said that he was with them instead of, you know, committing a crime against Cindy. So police pay a visit to the two Johns and they both separately corroborate Robert's story. He was with them and could not have possibly done those wretched things to Cindy. Police were stumped. It appeared the cops were divided. One officer, William Dennis, well, he believed Robert Hansen. Why would a businessman, a father of two and a husband do such a thing to this woman? And how stupid of someone to kidnap a person and take them to their home in the suburbs. But there was another cop, Officer Greg Baker, who had this feeling that Cindy was telling the truth. I mean, her story mostly checked out the plane, the house, his physical description. And how do you explain the handcuffs and her being barefoot and running into the street for help? The cops figured there was one last thing they could do before putting the file at the bottom of the pile. They offered Cindy a lie detector test. But when she declined, they were sure that a real victim would just take the polygraph. And with that, Robert was a free man. For many years, women had seemed to vanish into thin air in this part of Anchorage. It was the seedy underbelly off of Fourth Avenue, a place where people went for drugs or sex work. There were rows upon rows of topless bars and sex workers lined the streets. Well, many topless dancers seemed to vanish, poof, just disappeared into thin air. Their friends would report them missing, but since they were gone without a trace, police didn't do much investigating because it was the 70s and 80s and the women could have just packed it up and left. Or so the police thought. But eventually, bodies were popping up, and by the time that September of 83 rolled around, one police officer got a hunch that the missing and murdered women were somehow connected to Cindy's kidnapping case. In September of 1983, on the banks of the Knick River, a deceased female was discovered in a shallow grave. The victim was identified as 17-year-old Paula Golding. She was a topless dancer and she was reported missing five months earlier. After her discovery, Officer Baker got this itch like he felt something was off. So he reopened Cindy's case file and he wanted to look further into Robert Hansen's past. And that was when they pulled his entire file and found that he had actually been arrested for kidnapping and rape 12 years earlier. It was almost an identical crime to what Cindy alleged he did to her. By this point, there was a task force that had been put together to attempt to find the serial killer 
who was kidnapping and killing the topless dancers. Now, Officer Baker went over to the head of the task force, Sergeant Glenn Flothy or Floth. And Officer Baker was like, listen, listen, listen. We should really look into this Robert Hansen guy. And he filled him in on what happened to Cindy. And Flothy thought, "Hmm, what the heck? What do we have to lose? Meanwhile, the Anchorage PD had requested FBI assistance and the FBI sent up prolific FBI profiler John Douglas. Now, when John Douglas was up in Alaska, he began to come up with a profile. And when he was presented with Robert Hansen, he dug in and sure enough, even though on the surface, Robert Hansen didn't seem like the usual suspect, as Douglas dug into his past, not just his criminal past, he began to notice that Robert fit the profile of the serial killer they were looking for. For starters, Robert was extremely insecure. He was small in stature and he had a horrible stutter. To top it off, he had really bad acne scars that covered his face. Now, Douglas surmised that this fella must have been made fun of a lot in his younger years. But not only this, Robert was an excellent hunter. In fact, he impressed the local community when he took out a doll sheep with a crossbow. At this point, Douglas thought they should go back to the alibi witnesses to confirm if they were telling the truth. And he knows if Robert's alibi breaks down, everything else checks out. So they go back to the Johns and ask again, what were y'all doing on June 13th? And they double down. They give the same exact story. Uh Uh-huh, whatever. So Flothy tries a different tactic. He threatens these guys like, listen, what he is being accused of is very serious. If it turns out that you are lying for him, I will ensure that you are both charged with perjury. Of course, many friends would lie for a friend, but not that many friends want to go to jail for lying. And at this point, both men came clean. They weren't with Robert on the night in question, but they were willing to lie for him because they felt that the girl was just trying to extort him. Oh my gosh. Bingo. Got him. An arrest warrant was drawn up for Robert's arrest. And on October 27th, 1983, police showed up to Robert's bakery. They put him in handcuffs just as he had done to Cindy and they waltz him out of there and down to the precinct. At the precinct, police put Robert into a room with a bunch of files labeled with his name and all of his family's names. There were maps and gravesite images, and Robert was left there just to think about everything, and he was intrigued. Meanwhile, they were back at his house, tearing it up, trying to find evidence, and they searched and they searched and they searched, and they came up empty handed. They were just about ready to leave when one of the detectives was up in the attic and he was searching through all of the dust and the insulation there. And he was going through it inch by inch until he hit on something. And when he took it out, it was a treasure trove of items only a serial killer would have. According to an article titled Hunting Humans by David Lore, this is what they found a Remington 552 rifle, a Thompson Contender 7mm single shot pistol, an aviation map with specific locations marked off. Think treasure map with X's. They found jewelry, newspaper clippings, a Winchester 12 gauge shotgun, a driver's license, various IDs, some of which belonged to dead women, and a 223 caliber Mini 14 rifle. Back at the precinct, Robert was playing dumb. Huh? He didn't know anything. He didn't know why he was there or what they wanted him for. And he soon requested an attorney. And with that, he was booked and charged with assault, kidnapping, weapons offenses, theft, and insurance fraud. More on the insurance fraud later, I promise. On November 3rd, 1983, Robert was indicted on the same charges, but it wasn't long until the ballistic tests came back on the guns found at his house and bingo, they had found their serial killer because 
the ballistics matched some of their murder victims. Four months later, after negotiation discussions between Robert and the DA, the DA made a deal with the devil. In exchange for a full confession of all murders he ever committed, they would be willing to only charge Robert with the four current murders they were sure of, and he would be allowed to serve out his time in a federal prison. And with that sweetheart deal, they were able to uncover the almost full extent of this monster's crimes. At that point, that's when Robert started talking. In that documentary on investigation and discovery called Butcher Baker, Mind of a Monster, you can actually hear portions of the interrogation and you can hear Robert describe what happened. That map with 20 X's, it was exactly what you thought it was. It was a treasure map of all of the women Robert killed. They were all laying near the Kinnick River, murdered in Alaska's wilderness. Many journalists and writers who write about Robert Hansen, they liken him to someone who hunted humans because he described how he would take these women to meat shacks in the middle of nowhere. He would torture women for hours on end. And then when he was done, he would set them free into the wilderness. Then he would follow after them with a gun and shoot them dead. Sometimes he wouldn't have to set them free because these women would break loose and they would run. But they were so far from civilization that he knew they weren't going to be found. So he would run after them and hunt them that way. Investigators showed Robert a map and asked him to mark the spots where he left his victims. He identified 15 locations, 12 of which were unknown to investigators. But it's the Alaska wilderness, and who better to take them directly to the actual locations than the killer himself? So they asked him to take them to the bodies instead, and he agreed. They flew him to the locations, first to the Kinnick River, then to Jim Creek, then to Sestina, then Horseshoe Lake, and finally Figure 8 Lake. They marked the locations and would then return to excavate the sites. From those locations, they discovered seven additional victims. They never found any more bodies. According to an article written by David Lohr, here are the victims they discovered and their locations. On April 24th, they found Sue Luna near the Kinnick River. On the same day, they found Malay Larson near a parking lot by Old Kinnick Bridge. The following day, on April 25th, they discovered the remains of Delyn Frey near Horseshoe Lake. The following day, they found Teresa Watson near the Kenai Peninsula, and they also found Angela Fettern near the Figure 8 Lake. On April 29th, they found Tamara Peterson, a mile and a half from the old Kinnick Bridge. And on May 9th, they found Lisa Futrells, south of old Kinnick Bridge. In February of 1984, Robert Hansen pled guilty to the first degree murders of Paula Golding, Joanna Messina, Sherry Morrow, and Eklutna Annie, a Jane Doe. This Jane Doe has never been identified. It is said that Robert Hansen did not show an ounce of remorse in court. Robert was sentenced to 461 years in prison, plus life. Robert Christian Hansen was born on February 15, 1939 in Iowa. His father was a Danish immigrant baker and his mother was a homemaker. Her name was Edna. Christian, the father, was hard on his son. He was very strict and forced his son to work long hours in the family bakery. As indicated in Douglas's profile, Robert was made fun of in school because he was tiny, because he had terrible acne, and because he had a horrible stutter. One of the oddest things that I ever read was that while he was naturally left-handed, his parents forbade him from using his left hand. Robert would later state that the stress of using his non-dominant hand made his stutter even worse. Now, wait a minute. What's the deal with his parents not wanting him to be left-handed? I love left-handed people. I always find them so fascinating. Four of my favorite ladies are left-handed. My grandmother, 
my mother, my sister, and my oldest daughter. Yes, I guess that talent skipped me, but I do admit I'm a bit jealous. Anyway, I digress. Well, Robert always ended up being kind of a loner. He graduated from high school in 57 and soon enlisted in the Army Reserve. For anyone who doesn't know, military reserve duty only requires a person to work for the military once a month. So it's really part-time military. During his other time, Robert worked in his father's bakery. In 1960, at the young age of 21, he married a local girl. As you may recall that arson charge I mentioned earlier, well, what happened was that because he hated his upbringing in Pocahontas, Iowa, he actually burned down the school bus garage and he would have gotten away with it, except he told a friend and they turned him in. (laughs) Now, you may recall that he spent almost two years in jail for that incident, and it's not surprising during that time his wife filed for divorce. Now, I wasn't able to find it anywhere in my research, but I'm assuming he was released from the Army Reserve since, you know, he wasn't able to complete his commitment to the military because he was in jail. After he got out of jail, he met another woman and they were married in late 63. In 1967, they decided Iowa was no longer for them and they moved to Alaska. And Alaska was just the place for them. Robert felt like he fit in more with the outdoorsy feel of Alaska. He really took to hunting and people liked him because of his talents. In early 1980, Robert reported a burglary in his house. He filed an insurance claim, and according to David Lohr's piece, he was paid out $13,000 from his insurance policy. Robert took that money and invested it into a bakery that quickly became successful. By the way, it was reported that that burglary of Robert's house was a sham. It was a big insurance scam. Everything he reported missing, it was actually recovered during the search of his house. So. Turns out that in everything, Robert Christian Hansen was a huge scammer. Robert Hansen died on August 21st, 2014, at the age of 75. In 2013, a movie about Robert Hansen was created. It is titled Frozen Ground, starring Nicolas Cage, John Cusack, and Vanessa Hudgens. I've never seen the movie, so I can't vouch for it, but in case anybody else watches it, let me know how it is. All right, so what did you guys think? I swear, you can't make these things up. That's all I have for you today. If you tune in every single week and you like listening to these stories, feel free to leave a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts to help a sister out. Be sure to follow me on social on Instagram at Military Murder Podcast. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions and produced in collaboration with my boot camp and higher fan club members. This week's newest assistant producer is Zyra H. Our executive producers are Ryan R., Alicia H., Falcon 13, Nicole G., and Tina S., owner of Stitch 6 to 6 Embroidery. The music was created by Tyops. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of. So remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. (laughs) Shh, let's work on our podcast.